Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are, or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, let's go ahead and get started. It's 9.01, um, so I don't want to waste any time. Um, welcome. Um, and welcome to Understanding Race in the PR Classroom, Pervasive Issues in PR Education, presented by the Institute for Public Relations and the Public Relations Society of America Educators Academy. Thank you all for joining us to discuss this important topic today. My name is Dean Mundy. I'm an associate professor and the PR area director at the University of Oregon School of Journalism and Communication. I'd like to welcome today's host, David Brown, diversity advisor to the office of the Dean at Temple University, Natalie Tindall, department chair and associate professor at Lamar University, and Neil Foote, president and CEO of Foote Communications and president of the National Black PR Society. Today's session is the first of a three-part series for educators. Over the next three weeks, we will move from understanding the pervasive issues of race in higher education to learning the best practices, strategies, and tools for addressing race in the PR classroom and looking long-term regarding how to create systemic change, particularly creating a more diverse PR faculty and more diverse pipelines of practitioners. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. This is a Q&A type of forum to ask a question please click on participants at the bottom of your screen. You should be able to see that in the middle of the bottom of your screen and select the raise your hand feature. Do not physically raise your hand. Um, we won't probably be able to see that. Um, so please use the, the official raise your hand feature. Once you're called on, please remember to state your name and organization. Um, if you would like to ask a question anonymously, please do so by sending your message directly to Tina McCorkendale, who is listed as IPR Tina McCorkendale. Um, using, that chunk, using that function, Tina will be able to read your question aloud and, um, and it will remain anonymous. The discussion is being recorded and will be available for playback on the IPR website. Uh, we'll also send you an email with, uh, the, when the playback is available. Also, during the call this week or in, in the following weeks, if you have resources to share based on the discussion or anything that would be helpful, please do so by, share, by posting them in the open chat. Lastly, please remain respectful to our hosts and to others by keeping yourself muted at all times unless you intend to ask or, or, or ask a question or speak. Now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Natalie Tyndall to kick us off. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you so much, Dean, and hello, everyone. Um, this has been, or these have been some very trying weeks. This has been a very tough six months to go through for all of us. And I think right now, all of us are struggling and drinking from a fire hose and trying to absorb a lot of things. Um, and right now, my biggest ask of you all or ask of everybody on the call is that we need to accept the overwhelm and also not try and grasp everything at once. Um, there's going to be a lot of information that's presented today and through various other um, panels that you'll hear from IPR and PRSA Educators Academy and also through other groups. This will be a continual learning process. So I just ask that everybody think about and reflect upon and actually try to put into action everything they're doing and seeing and learning. But don't try and don't think that this is just going to be a one-time fix or that or be so overwhelmed that nothing can ever be done. I think small steps will lead us to some eventual change. Again, my name is Natalie Tyndall. I am a professor at Lamar University. I have been in public relations research and education for almost, oh my God, 20 years, I think. Almost, oh, that's, that's a long time. Um, and my research area has been diversity. And at one point in time, I stopped talking about diversity because I felt that we were getting nowhere in this conversation in the field. Um, a lot of us for many years through Beepers, National Black Public Relations Society, through the Diversity and Inclusion Committee at PRSA, we have championed and talked about and pushed for diversity and for diverse and changes and nothing's been done. So I am hopeful that this moment now this change in history will help to spur changes, not only in the industry, but also in our research and also in our teaching strategies as well. Um, I just have a couple of other things to say. Um, and they're just thoughts that came to mind when we, I was getting prepared for today. We are going to have to have painful but necessary conversations with ourselves um, where we, inter where we uh, interrogate whiteness and what whiteness means in our classroom what does what do these social constructions of race mean and how do they interact and interplay in what we do and what we teach and how we interact with our students how do we have anti-racist pedagogy that empowers all of our students um 
this is going to be a process, like I said. And I think we need to think about this question as we go forward. It's not just responding when the stuff hits the fan, but how will I continue to push this issue forward? How will I do better every single day? Not just now when everyone's protesting, but also when we get into December, when we get into June 2021 and June 2023. How do we continue to be better? So I'm very excited to have these conversations and talk about this issue and answer questions. And I will pass it over to David Brown, who is next, I believe. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tyndall. And, and good afternoon, morning, or at evening, wherever you all are. Um, uh, this is a, such an important conversation. And, and as, as uh, Natalie uh, so rightly framed it, that we now know that we're not going to be able to get it all in uh, 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 60 minutes. And even looking at the uh, number of folks who are on this particular chat, uh, it's clear that we've struck a nerve and just something that a lot of us have been talking about and, and and, and teaching on for some time. Uh, just as a quick background, I serve as a diversity advisor to the Office of the Dean at the Klein College of uh, Media and Communication at Temple University. Uh, I'm also um, a, a, a practicing practitioner. Uh, so I come out of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the practice uh, and continue to do so uh, in terms of the field. And, and also, full disclosure, I also happen to serve as a pastor. And why that might be relevant to this conversation now is that um, I happen to be uh, at a church or pastoring a church that uh, is in the hot spot uh, in terms of protests and things of that nature. And I say that in terms of framing this conversation and that we need to recognize that a lot of our students and a lot of our faculty are living in the areas and, and, and moments uh, that we uh, even sometimes just think about from an academic standpoint. So the fact that our classrooms really do not have borders, we need to kind of keep that in mind in terms of how we're trying to not only frame this conversation, but also how we try to teach what we're trying to teach. I think the other thing too, is that we need to recognize that uh, the work that we're doing now is, as, as Dr. Tindall correctly pointed out, is a long arc. A lot of us have been talking about this for a long time. Uh, we are definitely at a moment. Uh, and I would say that one thing we need to keep in mind is that this is not just a moment. This will be a series of moments that will happen going forward. I mean, as we are looking at where we are right now, June, whatever day this is, I feel like Groundhog Day, but whatever day this is, we got to recognize that we're preparing for a semester that's coming, whether it's going to be virtually uh, online or in person. And a lot of our students are going through this trauma that they've never experienced before. Uh, so as we look, look at uh, those types of opportunities, they are teaching moments that we can look at, uh, particularly as we uh, regather uh, back to um, our semesters, uh, but also kind of recognize it's going to take some work and we all need to smarten up regardless of our background or ethnicity or how we identify. It really is something that we need to figure out how we can do and hopefully we can share some of that information on this call, particularly because I do know and I'm looking at my Hollywood Squares grid on everybody kind of recognize that we've had a lot of these conversations in the past, a lot of us, and a lot of us have shared a lot of information with each other that have helped us to engender both conversation, but also give, equipping us with language to be able to ask those type of probing questions and have the kind of healthy dialogue. The last thing I'll say before I hand it over to my colleague, Neil Foote, is that we need to recognize that when we were conceiving this and uh, major props to uh, to Dean and, and to Tina for, for pulling this all together, we were considering that should this just be educators or should we open this up to students or should we, we kind of realize as the Educators Academy that we really need to have some real candid and safe space conversations among us as educators. Uh, we are going to be looking to, to, to kind of expand the conversation to other groups like uh, our students as an example, particularly PRSSA having established diversity and inclusion officers they need help from us as well, but we also need our safe space to talk candidly about what we're feeling and just, if I can borrow Dr. Tyndall's phrase, embracing the overwhelmingness of it all, but at the same time being honest with how we're feeling to be able to kind of make sure that we are moving in a, in a direction that makes sense. So with that, I'll hand over to my, my friend and colleague, Neil Foote. Thank you, David. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on uh, this important conversation. You know, one of a series that uh, we've had over the years and many more to come. Uh, I am here in Dallas, Texas. I uh, teach journalism at the University of North Texas Mayborn School of Journalism. 
Uh, I also uh, am president of the National Black Public Relations Society, affectionately called by, as Beepers. <laughs> so thank you, Natalie, for the shout out. And uh, David uh, has been a huge partner with us at Beepers with one of the most successful student chapters at Temple University for Beepers. Uh, you, what we've experienced and certainly uh, you know, to, to set up our conversation today, uh, particularly if we look at the last you know, kind of 60 days of our semesters here, uh, certainly for me, is that we, we not only had the pandemic and then this, this racial strife, Here's what I know. For many of my students at the University of North Texas, which uh, you know is, is a minority serving institution, we just got a designation as a Hispanic serving institution. For many of my black and brown students, I am the only diverse professor they ever see before they graduate. I'm proud of that. I'm glad they seek me out, but that only tells me we got a lot of work to do. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if some of you have seen some of the columns I've written for PR, uh, uh, PR News and uh, Compro Biz, uh, my, my viewpoints are, you know, we've got to do a lot of soul searching for defining our purpose. I, some of that is outwardly directly to the agencies, but I think it applies to us in academics. And I've actually spent the last kind of week with several of my colleagues uh, coming up with, I believe we came up with maybe a dozen or so points that we've shared with our deans uh, to, to really engage in this deeper conversation of who we are as a school of journalism, <laughs> uh, particularly in, in teaching these core concepts of, of creating and shaping images and messages, how we better reflect the diversity in our recruitment and our faculty, uh, and even at the administration level, uh, because uh, what we know is that leadership drive, helps drive this importance to diversity at our institutions. And if we can get the president, no less the Board of Regents or the Chancellor to, to really be our champions, we know that others will follow, on, follow us in, in not just being the lone voices in a room, uh, I can tell you for Natalie and David and I, and, and I know for others, um, you know, we've been in high demand these days. I wonder why that is. I, I, I'm not, I'm okay with that. I'm really okay with that because I, I, you know, if in fact today's conversation, the many others I've had in the past few weeks and the others that I can hope to have with many of you in the future, can help us move this ball aggressively down the road. And I think that's what has been amazing the last couple of weeks. I was just talking to my daughter, 27, kind of right in the heart of, of who are moving this moment. And that, that the fact that I, I, I think we have to really acknowledge the fact, over the weekend, protest in 50 cities calling for change in America. I mean, certainly Dr. King is probably doing a, a high five and, and, and all sorts of other jumping jacks to the fact that this movement of change, of social change, of, of civil rights, to use an old phrase, no less diversity, equity, equality, and inclusion, are more important today than ever. Then I'm glad we're having these conversations. I'm glad everyone is seeing that, that this can be done uh, collaboratively uh, and done very effectively if we all believe in it. So I look forward to your questions and conversation today and down the road. Thank you. Good, good, Dr. Tindall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Dean, did you have anything else to say before we jumped into question and answers? No, I'm good. No, I think, I think this is good. I, I, I will bring everybody's um, attention to Natalie's point that this is a conversation. Um, this is, uh, so please ask your questions in the chat, um, or you can direct them directly to um, David, Natalie, or Neil, um, who are the co-hosts, um, and we will, we will just tackle them as we go. And Tina's also taking questions as well. So. Um, and and, I, and you probably saw um, Tina's point when we began, we didn't realize that we had a cap at 100. So there are a lot of people who couldn't get in, but um, the uh, IPR has fixed that and I can see that people are joining. So please, if you had some um, colleagues, friends who could not get in, please let them know that they can now. So we will get going um, with the questions. Okay. 
And I see one hand raised and I see a question that is in the chat from Suzanne Boys asking to Neil's point about the lack of representation in the classroom. What can we do to shift that even while facing hiring freezes? Any creative solutions in the near term from anyone? Um, I think one of the things that we have to think about is who are we inviting into our classrooms as well as guest speakers? Or who are we inviting in to be um, clients and judges and uh, judges for presentations and things like that? So I think that is one easy way to diversify the classroom. Also, because many of us will be high flex, hybrid, virtual next semester, you can invite practitioners from around the country pretty much into your classroom as well, so they do not have to travel. So I think that would be an easy way to bring that representation and diversity in. Um, Damian Waymer and Keenan Brown and another scholar in 2011 did a paper on African American students in our PR classrooms. And they said that the one thing that we can do, the one recommendation, well, they had three recommendations, one of which was bringing diverse speakers into the classroom. That can serve, it, that can be so many things because a lot of students, they do not see themselves in the PR profession. They do not see black professionals. They do, they have not run into black professionals or black professionals or people of color who have a disability who are in public relations. So I think the more we can think about bringing these diverse voices into our classrooms as speakers, as contact, as subject matter experts is very important. So Neil and David, what do you think? Absolutely. I would say the other thing, too, is look at um, who we're hiring as adjuncts, because we, we know that, uh, that uh, a lot of our, because we are going to be in hiring freezes, we're trying to figure out how then are we going to continue to, to look at those classes uh, and in terms of populating those classes. So even with who we have, I think that we might want to take a look at uh, our adjuncts in terms of uh, not only inviting them in, but also moving them in and looking at it as, at the pipeline. Most of what we're doing at Temple, as an example, we're trying to take a look at <clears throat> representation in terms of faculty, but it's not just numbers. So not just, you know, how many people who identify as diverse, but how many of those folks who identify as diverse are tenured? How many are tenured track? How many are non-tenured? Uh, non and kind of looking at that, and are we intentional about moving people up the pipeline? I think Neil made a very, very good point in his remarks about, you know, having students, and I've had the same thing too, that some students saying that I'm the only African-American professor that they've encountered, and which is proudly, to your point, uh, to, to the point that Neil made, but also sadly, because if, if someone has gone through 12 years of high school and then a couple more years in college, and I'm the first professor that they've encountered, that says a lot of, about our pipeline, so we have to look at that. And I agree, uh, particularly uh, to, to the point that was made about Suzanne's point about the hiring freeze, one of the things we have to look at is that if we were committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion before the pandemic and certainly before the social unrest, and we know that we need to continue that because one thing that we're going to try to look at from a research standpoint, um, my, my colleagues at Temple are looking at, so how committed are folks after the crisis passes, right? So because we're not just a moment in time where we become excuse the phrase, the flavor of the month, because I know Natalie, Neil, and I have all been very, very busy of late, always busy, but even more so now. But if the crisis then starts to, to fade, is the commitment now going to fade? We're hoping that, and I saw this phrase uh, a couple of days ago, instead of bouncing back, how to bounce forward, right? into a point where we put some structural place, things in place. And the last thing I'll say before I hand it off to Neil is never let a good crisis go to waste. We are at a moment in time. There may be some things that have been languishing for some time that we could probably gain some uh, accelerant, if you will, uh, to make some things happen that otherwise wouldn't have. Or as we know, most of our academic institutions are, you know, are not the most nimble in the world. How can we possibly use these things that even in this moment to make some things happen that could not have happened with any expediency before. Yeah, no, thank, thank you, Dave. Those are, those are all you know, right on, right on time. And uh, yeah, thanks for the, the folks who are chiming in on the chat. That yeah, you know, remote. Uh, I guess I need to. Uh, uh, yeah, there you go. I am. I wanted to make sure I was unmuted. That you know, remote teaching uh, does open the door to invite speakers from around the country. Uh, and yeah, and I've done it in a couple different ways. One, I've done it uh, uh, live, and then I've done kind of in podcast style, where I, I've reached out to some of my best friends in the business and said, "Hey, look, you got a half hour. I just want to chat with you about an issue," and I make that available to my students. 
Yeah. Secondly, this point of what do we do now that we're in a hiring freeze? So uh, I think uh, both Dale and Natalie, uh, David and Natalie alluded to that. You know, here's an opportunity to talk to about our, our hiring practices, our search committees. Uh, you know, I know at UNT we've now involved the uh, the Office of Diversity and Equity, who are providing training and requiring training for every search committee chair to go through to understand how to make sure their searches are as broad as possible. So here's an opportunity to kind of look at policy. Uh, it's also that the fact of the matter is we are what we are. Our departments and schools are what we are from a a racial and gender difference. So use this opportunity to benefit uh, from, from the, the, uh, the plethora of case studies that we now have a chance to, to use in messaging about race, about image, how you handle it, certainly how media has portrayed certain communities. Uh, so I would say we all on this, uh, this webinar today have the tools in our classroom, no matter admittedly how slow our departments or schools may use but we have the power of that that classroom to really do some powerfully interesting things and the tendency is we get stuck right we get stuck because that's the syllabus i've used and i update the dates you know i might change a few readings but that's what i teach you know i can't teach intro any other different way well i'm asking you as we go into the fall Think about other ways you can integrate some of these core topics about uh, D&I D, uh, D into those conversations that may just be the trigger to help uh, any of your students realize the power that they have and the roles that they may take on in PR in the future. Uh, that could be transformative in terms of, of you know, how we frame these issues, how we message these issues, how we have crisis come in these issues. You know, they could be the person hired <laughs> at Facebook to help Zuckerberg position that company. They could be the, the PR person for one of our education institutions uh, that may have to respond to uh, movements on this campus. Uh, so, you know, leverage that expertise that you all have. Be a little bit nimble in the classroom. Uh, and then work with your, your department chairs and associate deans and chairs to say, hey, we need, we need to take a half a day or a day just to dive in, all of us, because it's not just David, Neil, and, Nat and Natalie's problem. It's our issue. We're preparing the next generation. We have to get them ready for a world that is, is gosh, you know, I don't even know what. 2021 looks like let's get through july you know? but i think it's on us to prepare our students to be ready uh, and that has to be ready for all issues not just those that are fundamentally getting them ready to be good professionals but also good contributors to society and one thing to add on to what neil said is that diversity should not be one week on your syllabus and that stuff should not just be encapsulated there um, once upon a time, ethics was just a week on the syllabus and people worked throughout PR education to get ethics integrated into every part of the curriculum. Diversity should be every part of the curriculum, every part of the class experience, because again, all these things matter, whether you're talking about crisis or even the history of public relations and getting away from the great four white men, four white male models. Um, you know, and using diverse practitioners and finding diverse practitioners and finding diversity in campaigns, those things are incredibly important as well. So um, I think they're hand raised, hands raised, and I'm not sure how to do that. <laughs> Sarah or Nikki, can someone help us with that? Okay, yes. Yeah, so I think, uh, Margaret, you have your hand raised. Oh, so thank you. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I plan on, I'm going to be teaching at Washington State University in the fall. I'm going to be teaching a media strategies and techniques class, a, a campaigns class. I'm going to be talking with my students a little bit about activism in PR. Um, and I think that we'll end up having some interesting conversations in the class. And I'm just wondering if maybe Educators Academy or this group will be able to kind of pull any kind of resources to help you, to help faculty engage in so tricky conversations in a majority white classroom, you know, where there might be one or two or three black students or students of color, 
Um, it's just, um, I, I've been in that situation before and it's, and it's tricky and I'm wondering if others would like to talk about that or could we find a way to maybe find resources to help those of us who are trying to engage with some difficult, sensitive topics in the classroom? Margaret, this is David. I'd love to address that and thank you for that question I, I, because I think what we will all find that unfortunately, just as you know, Neil and, and Natalie had mentioned, you know, even in our classrooms, uh, even the classrooms like at, at Temple where we're probably a little bit more, more diverse, you know, the kids of color are certainly remain in the numerical minority. Uh, and I think that sometimes, and to the point that was made even on the chat, that sometimes when we start talking about diversity, some of our folks who don't identify as diverse, they, if, if they're, they may be physically there, but their minds check out. I think part of what we, and I think this is a great uh, role that uh, uh, the academy can certainly play is, and how I teach it, particularly as it relates to looking at diversity, is every one of us has diversity. All of us are diverse. And, and because we're, as, as an example, we are a female dominated um, uh, profession on certain levels, but when you get closer to the C-suite, not so much. So thinking about that as a way to have our students identify with marginalized voices because that mm -hmm. happens all the time and, and not as a way to dilute it. And I'm, I'm always very careful about, okay, well, we wanna talk about the you know, African-American or Latino or LGBTQ. I get all that because that is certainly important on all those segments. But if we can't teach it in such a way that our students will, it, it will not only get it, but embrace it because what I, the worst thing we could do is have them only know about, you know, Ophiel Dukes, for example, in name, as if we can answer that as a, you know, multiple choice question as, okay, so who helped to bring in the uh, national observance of MLK Day? Well, the answer is Ophiel Dukes. But if you don't dig deeper, because if, I, if, my, if I'm just caring about it to answer the question, as opposed to a point of exploration, so I can find out the, the richness, if you will, of the diversity within our field and me, however I identify, can find my voice in that, then it becomes more than just a lesson that stays there. It becomes a lesson that can help shape life going forward. So, and, and I agree with you. I think that we need to find, and I'm sure even on this call in this gathering, there's a lot of techniques uh, that a lot of uh, folks who are on this call, and, and I, we, we have been talking about somewhat of a repository uh, of best practices that could uh, provide us with how do you do what you do. So that could also be a role that the academy can play. I think too, one thing to think about and going back to this topic, race is a social construction. It is not real, it is not biologically based. We don't talk a lot about that in our communication classes and especially in our mass communication and in our public relations classes. So I think when we start talking about demographics and getting into PR campaigns and things like that, we need to start talking about the social construction of why these things exist and how they really don't capture what they are supposed to capture. And also to getting into this might be too difficult for some classes if, unless they're a bit more advanced, but intersectionality and that there are multiple identities and sometimes those identities meet at an intersection like two cars and they clash and they create consequences or benefits for certain people. And what does that mean in terms of how we are creating messages for certain groups or not creating messages for certain groups? So I think that there's a lot that can be done. It's just a matter of decorporatizing our, our, our curriculum and moving away from what marketers do, what advertisers do, and really getting to the crux of there are people who have different life experiences because of these social constructions and how we talk to them as organizations, as causes, matter. Yeah, and there are a couple uh, uh, points I want to make and particularly address some of the questions that have popped up in chat. But yeah, I, I, I'm sure yeah, as, as uh, we mentioned earlier, this, this conversation will be made available later so you can share it with your colleagues. There's some great links that you all are providing uh, in the chat box with articles. I mean, those, you know, to, to, to the, the question about what resources, yeah, I hope we can curate these links and make them available to, to, to all of us and our, our colleagues, uh, because that's always 
a big issue is that, you know, look, I, this is my area of expertise. I don't have time to do additional research to find out the best resources. Well, look, I, you know, if we can provide a list of 100 potential articles, uh, you know, videos, that's one way to kind of in, in, in embrace our colleagues in this, as well as uh, to the question of how do we get our students uh, involved in this. I, I think there are a couple different ways. You know, one, you know, if we use some of the case you know, of, of what's happening in our world around us and, and create our own case studies around those, applying principles that are, are fundamental to uh, our PR, uh, uh, tactics and strategies, those, that's one way to address diversity and inclusion without saying, hey, today we're gonna to talk about race. And, and yeah, the same as our faculty rolls our eyes, we've all been there, I've been there. And I, I used to teach a race, gender, and media class and clearly there were students who were just taking it to get the credit and they would sit in the back of the class and slump in their chairs, rolling their eyes at every subject until kind of their peers called them out and then they kind of sat up because, you know, our students are our best advocates for some of these issues and how we empower our students to discuss these subjects uh, in, in creative ways that don't necessarily have to be labeled under the, the, under the issue of race or diversity, fundamentally get to, the, to how they use these skills and address a critical issue. Um, you know, I think the, the, uh, the, the other practice there then is you know finding you know, resources and articles uh, that address these issues. Uh, someone other else also made a great comment in the chat is that you can bring in uh, people of color uh, to chat to your class on issues that don't necessarily have to deal with race, diversity, and inclusion. Because uh, guess what? If they were hired at Edelman or Publicis or or Rotofin, they probably are pretty good at what they do and what they do. So bring them in to talk about how they did a crisis comp strategy for X company or how they manage their entertainment clients. Bring them in because that's another message that we can send to all students, uh, but particularly uh, to address this other issue about how do we get more black and brown males in this <laughs> industry uh, is we got to show examples, you know, yeah, you know, David and I need to clone ourselves so that we can be in multiple places <laughs> at multiple times to show that, yeah, black men are in this business. We're wearing multiple hats. We're using all of our skills. Uh, the opportunity for, for our, our uh, black and brown males to see that there is opportunity in this business. You can have a career in it. You can make money. You can have impact is a subtle way to say, oh, all right, this is kind of cool. Uh, I think I want to do that. And, and that has to be replicated. Uh, and then the fourth point about that is we just have to seek out some of those students. We have to say, hey, look, Neil, why don't you come by my office and let's talk about your interest in PR. What do you want to do? Look, I know all of us have had students who were just heartbroken because their internships this summer you know, you know, went away. Uh, you know, the problem with internships generally, right, for many of our diverse students is that if it's in New York, Chicago, LA, or DC, and it's non-paying, uh, they, uh, you know, I'm not going to say all of those of my black and brown students can't afford to do that, but most of them are coming to me saying, hey, I got to take something locally because I can't afford to do that. So we, you know, that's another kind of industry-wide uh, opportunity that us is in the education world need to press the industry to say, look, free is not free. They got to pay for the credits. <laughs> and so even if it's an internship, they got to pay for it. So we got to create opportunities that can underwrite those expenses for valuable experiences that other students will get that will lead to that first job that will hopefully hook them in the industry and, and give them a career path. Okay, I do have some questions to ask you. And just a note uh, that uh, Sarah Jackson is compiling um, everyone's sort of comments in, and we will send that out after so everyone will have it. Uh, so there are a couple questions relating to um, scholarship. And uh, I'm going to, even though they're separate, I'm going to, I'm going to bunch them together. So maybe you can um, talk about it. One is um, with regard to peer scholarship, there's talk about white scholars profiting from the um, Black Lives Matter movement through study and publication. Um, if you could speak to this and whether PR scholars are failing the black community 
um, and ways that scholars can be better inclusive. And also along those lines is also, um, how do we account for the labor being asked of our BIPOC, uh, Black, Indigenous, People of Color, practitioners and scholars? This seems like an unfair burden to place on them right now. Mm. Wow, who wants to start? <laughs> can I take the second question first? Um, let's talk about the burden. The burden has been African-American, well, BIPOC um, faculty have had that undue burden for many years. It's been documented for decades that there's been extra, extra service work that we have to do of mentoring students, of doing, being on diversity committees and doing all these other things because of who we are. Um, I, I think that, yes, it is a, a lot of undue burden that is placed on us, especially at this moment of time. I think one thing that we have to think about is for our white colleagues, please don't come to us with white guilt. So we, and we have to figure that out and work with that through, work that out with you because oftentimes that's going to be center of the conversation versus some of the pain and some of the other things that we're dealing with. So I think working through your own issue, working through that issue that you have and thinking about how you can become not only an ally, but also a co-conspirator with some of us, because what we need our sponsors or what, especially our junior faculty, they need, and our graduate students, they need sponsors who are going, who to, going to go into rooms and speak on their behalf, advocate for them, help move them up. They need those things. How can you help with that? How can you use your privilege to help those students of color, undergraduate through graduate, but also your junior faculty? I think that's what's incredibly important. So I think for, I think it's great to start these conversations and have us talking about it, but also too, I think that there's a level of individual work that people need to work through, thinking about your pedagogy, thinking about your own anti-racism, anti-racist things, as well as thinking about how can you not weaponize your whiteness, but also, but use your whiteness to help others who are of color, who are in precarious situations in the academy. I will say, this is a book that I just finished reading. It's Radical Hope, a Teaching Manifesto by Kevin Gannon. I think this book is one great book for people to go through and start thinking about and questioning the hidden curriculum they have in their head as it relates to the academy and what it means to be a professor. I also think Teaching to Transgress by Bell Hooks is a great book. There's a lot of great pedagogical books that people need to start absorbing and thinking about. So I'll say that that's, that's my take. I think there's a lot of work that we need to do individually before we come to people of color and ask them to help emotionally labor with you. And if I can build on Dr. Tindall's uh, great, great point, and we're gonna put all some of these uh, books because the chat has just been very, very helpful so we can capture some of those things. Uh, three quick points I wanna make. One, uh, particularly as it relates to the burden. Yep, absolutely, but it's a burden we've been carrying. And I think what you hear from Natalie, Neil and I is that one we embrace, you know, gladly, but can't always make sure that everyone will embrace that. Uh, you know, at myself as, as an example, I consider every moment a teaching moment. So being able to do that can help direct people to get themselves equipped because the point is, we have work, we all have work to do. In order to do this work, this is a long race. So being able to in, invest in articles and smartening ourselves up, giving ourselves language, things of that nature can help to really propel the, the conversation, but recognize that it's not just one book we'll read and now we're woke, right? It doesn't work that way. So we have to make sure that we can really uh, use uh, this opportunity. And that kind of leads me to my second point about looking at uh, books, uh, particularly that may not be in the you know public relations curriculum that can help provide some broader issues like uh, the book White Fragility, or uh, I highly recommend Evicted, which gives a really good sense of how the economics of race uh, kind of work. Or even um, those books may not necessarily be on the reading list. And honestly, I would urge folks to read it first before you suggest it to the class, because there are going to be some, some, some harsh realities that have to be, be taken. And the third point I want to make is that it goes back to the notion of burden. Well, actually, two more points. The other notion of burden is that uh, I think Margaret before had mentioned, like, I have few kids of color in my class. Well, we don't want to put them on the spot 
uh, because that may not be a burden that they either equipped or ready or want to, uh, amenable to, to, to embrace. So it's not our students' job to, to represent, if you will. They feel so com compelled, wonderful, but again, it puts folks on the spot and not just people of, of color, but we're talking about folks who might identify as LGBTQ or whatever it might be. We have some power, and I'm going to use that word very, very intentionally as instructors to guide these kind of conversations. The last point I'll make has to do with scholarship. One thing we have to recognize is that our academy in particular, in terms of looking at the publications who publish, what is written by scholars of color is underrepresented as well. So when we're looking at boards that are making these decisions, um, major shout out to, to folks uh, like IPR and, and, and Tina who are giving voice to some work that I was before just underrepresented. Uh, because if we have to legitimize our scholarship uh, to an editorial board that may or may not value that scholarship, again, we have to start finding ways to get into that mix so that diverse view is starting to be represented about this scholarship, this publication, or this research is valuable and it's gonna help move some things along uh, that will help to continue to inform the path we're all trying to travel. I'll just add to, to the point about scholarship. Um, you know, I, I am not a tenure track. I'm a principal lecturer. I've gone as far as I can. Uh, I don't have a PhD. I have two masters. But yeah, I've been teaching for 13 years, and, and I see my, my good friend and colleague, Jackie Lendiers, uh, in, in the conversation. And yeah, here's, here's one thing Jackie did early on um, that helped me with with scholarship and getting that kind of exposure with some of the research she was doing. She immediately, in the first year I was there, invited me to sit down with a couple other faculty members. She was putting together some panels for AJMC and said, look, Neil, you know, I think we could use your expertise on this and immediately on board of me to try to get that exposure. Uh, so I think there are opportunities to say, you know, are, are, are white folks gonna take advantage or, or use the moment in time to do some great research on this? Yeah, yeah of course, if you should, I hope. We should have annals, we should have books on this. That's what this is all about. What I do hope is that you'll look across, you know, the, the, the uh, if not your campus, at least look across the industry, uh, perhaps even to some people in, in this conversation to say, and say, wow, you know, I would really love to work with X, don't know them really well, but let me see if I can use my network to get an introduction to them and collaborate with, with professors of color to do some of this research. Uh, one, to kind of help balance the perspective you might have on that. Uh, and then the other part is we know with funding for research, um, you know, look, UNT has become a tier one. So, you know, we're on the soft sciences of the world. So any dollars, you know, us folks on the journalism side bring in is a plus plus. <laughs> so, you know, any number of colleagues, uh, you know, outside of me, my mind is a couple of the others on, on my team who would love to figure out how we collaborated and some already are. So look at that as an opportunity to say, well, how could we get a grant that benefits, you know, our mutual institutions that then get us the scholarship and certainly, for, for junior faculty who are trying to get uh, get that, that that scholarship to get tenure, you know, there's a great opportunity, and I would hope again that that this moment in time presents uh, you know a treasure trove of opportunity for us to do some really thoughtful research and timely research. My big thing was a lot of what's out there on race and diversity is five, six, ten years old, and I'm like. Shh. No, I'm sorry, I, I can't find any articles on this, folks, so you've got to listen to me talk about my journey. I'm sure we've all done that. It's like, oh, no, another foot story. Oh, geez. You know, but that's what we have to do uh, to make it relevant, timely, and realistic to our students who are, who are going to go to their phone and say, hey, I just found this hashtag. What you got to say about that? And I, I'm just going to, one quick point. I work with um, the Deaf Studies and Deaf Education Department here on my campus. And there's a rule there that if hearing people are going to write about deaf people and deaf culture, you need to have a deaf person on the article. And not just as a figurehead, but actually as someone doing the work and helping to expand that scholarship. And I think that's very important to this. Of course, we all capitalize on moments because we have to do research. That's part of the academy. That's part of the neoliberal institution that we are a part of. I get it. But also at the same time, 
who's in your network that you are including or excluding from these opportunities that you are creating and also giving. That is incredibly important in these conversations. So sometimes it's a matter of, I don't know black faculty. Sometimes it's a matter of, I don't know black graduate students. It's a matter of expanding who you know, so you can ask them if they would like to work on projects with you. That's a part of sponsorship. That's a part of allyship. That's what we need. That's what junior scholars need. That's what graduate students need too. Okay, um, I have more questions. I probably have a lot more questions than we have time for, even though we have 15 minutes. Uh, but uh, Jen Vardaman Winter had her hand up. Um, Jen, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, thanks, Tina. Um, and thanks, Natalie and um, Dr. Uh, Brown and Professor Foote um, for this great conversation. Um, uh, my original question was I wanted to talk about curriculum. I'm going to try to like make an effort in my faculty to uh, encourage all faculty to increase like the uh, readings by um, scholars of color by a certain percentage over the next year, um, particularly on topics that are not necessarily diversity related. But um, the question, but I think we've kind of worked on that so far today, um, something that I'm coming up against right now is that I have grad students who are really, so we have a very um, racially and ethnically diverse student population. Um, so I, I don't share the same issues that some of you do like in kind of the more rural uh, schools with mostly white students. Um, and we have a very bad representation on our faculty. Um, we have no tenure and tenure track faculty who are black. And that is something that I'm going to be kind of really working to change over the next years after we um, get out of the hiring freeze. But um, I have grad students coming to me who really want like mem mentorship and they really want, um, you know, they're, they're upset about what's going on and I really want to mentor them. However, I'm white and I do that, but I also know that they probably need, um, they would benefit also from having a, a black faculty of color or a, a black faculty member or a Latinx faculty member as a mentor as well. And I recognize that there's a burden put on those uh, faculty or even staff members who have PhDs throughout the university, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm looking for help and suggestions on, you know, I can't keep calling my friend Natalie and saying, hey, can you serve as a mentor for this? Um, student, I'm helping her, but I think she would really benefit from you because I know Natalie gets overwhelmed and I'm really glad that you brought that up at the beginning. So um, I'm really looking for some sincere um, ideas about how I can do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll dive in and, and uh, it, you certainly, uh, Jennifer, yeah, you'll, um, you know, we'll make sure you share my contact uh, info with you and I'll be glad to you know, make the network of, of uh, public relations professionals we have with beepers around the country available, that we have local chapters in, in yeah, we have about a dozen local chapters, so not every city, but what we know is that there are many black PR professionals who are out there doing work, and if not through beepers, through my work at uh, the, the National Association of Black Journalists, uh, we, can, we can figure out how to make some of those connections. Uh, and, you know, again, through the the good work of David and and even Pat Ford has uh, started a student chapter down at the University of Florida, uh, and we've got a couple others percolating uh, uh, that that we can look at uh, those. So so we'd be glad to figure out how we can create a more formal one an informal network for you and your students so that that you have a a bit of a, a, a I'll use the old school term Rolodex of folks to to, go, to reach out to. Uh, and it could be an opportunity for us uh, to build a more, more formal network, uh, either through IPR uh, and, and even deeper. I uh, saw so someone raise a great question about how do we inspire, you know, uh, students of color in high school, uh, where 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 a lot of influence is about what career choices can be made, and you know, there could be some interesting pilot programs and key markets that we could do uh, along the way outside of the work that we're doing in colleges. Thank you for the question and, and looking forward to figuring out how we work with you, Jennifer. Thank Jen, you. If I may just to add to what Neil said already, and, and this is kind of echoes with, uh, with, with what Natalie had also offered, that it does take a village. I mean, I think that you, it, whomever you're connecting with, is you're, you're, you're 
super fortunate to have someone like Dr. Tyndall who's like, hey, I can or someone else who will. But, you know, what, what uh, Natalie mentioned about having good allies and sponsors and, you know, because there are going to be some rooms where they need to be advocated for that uh, myself or Natalie or Neil or anybody else of color may not even be in or even invited in. So I'm thinking that what, you know, it's, it's almost like what I've helped, tried to help do with some of our students on several levels at, uh, at, at Temple is kind of recognize they all need their own board of directors or board of advisors, maybe even more appropriately. But the point that uh, Natalie made before about if, if, if you need one, so it's not one person's burden, it becomes a collective burden and that network starts to spread out and that makes the, the road a little bit better. And there's a, there's a great African proverb that says, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. And that go together is really what needs to happen in order, because that's what life's gonna be going forward. You will mentor as you're being mentored. And I think that that's a very key point. Okay, so uh, we do have a couple of questions about curriculum, but um, Eric Wingfield asked, um, what are some tangible things that we can do in our classrooms to encourage our students to not only embrace an understanding of diversity and inclusion, but also prepare them to participate in the conversation and be part of the change? Mm. Great question. Uh, can, can I take a quick stab? And I know we're, we're running short on time. I would say, Tina, that you know, part of it is, you know, how we can give, well, we have to give ourselves safe space to have these conversations. So this is a great start for that. But also, I think that we also need to start, particularly with our students who identify as diverse, to kind of recognize, get ready for the long uh, run. I mean, it's, it's almost like when, you, when a person who identifies as diverse walks into a room, whether it's a classroom or a boardroom, their presence can become somewhat of a protest. So there's, so, there's also some responsibility to that. So part of what we need to start to do is to help to both educate them about you know, the power that they have, but also provide some language. Uh, because I, you know, that, I, one thing we don't want to do is send kids in that a low person on a totem pole, they decide to you know, stand up and protest and next thing they're looking for a job. So that's, that's not the best way to do it. But I think that part of what we need to be able to help them to do is really kind of start to form their voices while they're starting to understand the industry at the entry level, uh, meaning freshmen. Let it start there and then start to build up. And then we've got a great opportunity to really smarten up on a lot of different levels that can really put some really, really strong folks out there uh, that are coming up and want to transform the industry. And that's exactly, we need to give them the tools to know how to do. I agree. I think that's a fantastic answer right there. It's, uh, I have nothing else to add. That's a great answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you know, one of the themes out of this conversation is particularly for our, our, uh, the students that we have who are people, uh, students of color, is we, we, you know, any way any of us could establish a relationship with all of our students is important. I know our time is always stressed. But I, I think if we're seriously important, uh, you know, concerned about uh, uh, retention of these students, and and I would venture to say that going into this school year, uh, there's a great deal of anxiety not only for the, the the pandemic and how they plowed through the semester in whatever way they did, and now a summer that will be you know overlaid with a tremendous uh, amount of of uh, critically sensitive issues. You know, any way we can establish those conversations and relationships outside of the, the form of the classroom it doesn't have to be in a, in a condescending way. It could be a group, could be a way just to say, how's it going? How's your summer? What's on your mind? What, you, what are you trying to accomplish? That helps begin to, to layer that conversation. And yeah, some of these students, uh, you know, may be out in front and want to get in front, in front of this issue and will be actively engaged in it. And that's where, you know, uh, you know, whenever I have students who are like, you know, that's what I want to do this. I'm like, look, you, you, you've got a cell phone. You've got more power than I ever had in 1981 to do anything. So you can, yeah, you know, how do you want to use it? What do you want that image to be of yourself moving forward? And are you aware of the, the risk and rewards uh, of doing those kinds of actions to help you prepare yourself for those opportunities in, the career, in, in a career you might want to pursue? Or in some cases, it's a, it is a period of discovery of defining 
how they want to, 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 you know, what they want to pursue and how they want to position themselves in the future. So, uh, Uh oh, looks like we, we lost. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> um, one person asked a question, and I'll freeze. Am I defrozen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It says my internet connection is unstable, which is a good description of my life right now. So perfect. Um, so uh, we uh, one of the questions was about uh, research. There was a question about writing assignment, and I think that was answered in the chat. Um, but if anyone has any suggestions for um, uh, one class is focused on race, social justice, but recommending a relatively short read to prepare people to do research with multicultural publics. If anyone has any suggestions or resources for that, uh, please uh, share in the, um, in the chat. Uh, so what we want to do, and then we'll close out, is maybe uh, Neil, Natalie, and David, if you could take just, if you just want to take like a minute to give a, a, any sort of wisdom, parting thoughts uh, before we uh, close it out. Neil, would you like to go first? <laughs> sure. Three things. Uh, take this moment to define your purpose, not only personally, but also what your school of journalism, your department is doing, how they're doing it, and, and what uh, you and, and can do better. Uh, in that discovery, I believe you will, you, you should also take into account how can you find new voices? Uh, how can I go beyond the usual suspects, the usual people who always say things and introduce my, my staff, my faculty to new people, new ideas and new opportunities. Uh, and yes, let's use this opportunity if need be based on those two other points that if we need to restructure, we re redefine our curriculum. We know curriculum changes take forever, so you know, better get started now. So maybe by 2025, they'll get approved by the, the coordinating boards, right? But seriously, uh, you know, uh, look at that from courses, from structure of the, the department, and use this opportunity to look at those things. Mary? I would say there's there's several levels of change that need to happen first at the individual level, thinking about your own self and what you need, the work we all need to do to think about how we approach diversity, inclusion, equity issues in our classroom. Um, also to thinking about your pedagogy, thinking about what's happening in your classroom and the hidden curriculum that you have there. Um, also thinking about our student organizations and how we reinforce certain cultures and reinforce certain beliefs in those organizations and finally cha making change in our departments. We did not touch on getting internships and things like that, but that's incredibly important as well. But I think that thinking about those things first, your individual self and how you can change your classroom, like Neil said at the beginning, those are the easiest things we can start to change. We make shifts in those, you can shift your entire department. So I think that's a great thing to start with. And I'll be very, very brief. Recognize that this is a, a marathon, not a sprint, but recognize the race is already on. Uh, so we can either decide to, to, to join it or be run over by it. So I think our sense of agency and urgency is very important as we continue to, as I said, not bounce, bounce back, but bounce forward. Perfect. And just to, uh, to uh, close us out, I wanted to thank Neil, Natalie, and David um, very, very much. Uh, um, uh, they're three great friends, and they've always been fantastic for us. So we appreciate you taking the time because we know you're really busy to have this conversation. And as David said, you know, this is definitely a marathon and not a sprint. So I know IPR and Dean and I have spoke about continuing this uh, past the three-part series because it's clear that there are so many different topics we need to talk about and it just makes our society and our universities better. Um, and thanks to the educator, PRSA Educators Academy and, and to Dean for their leadership on this. Um, we're going to assemble and send out the resources and our next panel is on June 18th next week when we have Stephanie Mahan and Natalie we're getting our third presenter. And then on June 25th, we're going to focus on diversifying PR faculty. And we have Damian Waymer, um, Bailing Shaw, and Rochelle Ford, who are going to speak there. Uh, so uh, please definitely uh, sign up for this. And is there anything I missed, Dean? Sorry, I was muted. No, I think that's good. No, I think that's it. And I think that we just, 
it's important to emphasize this is a marathon so the conversation this is just the start of the conversation and we'll continue it next thursday and then the thursday after that